and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. So as we come together this morning, we just want you to come with uh, giving thanks because there's a lot of people who wanted to be in church this morning, couldn't be for whatever reason. So we want you to just stand up as we give praise unto God and just, you know, declare his glory. Amen. 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 time we're going to be reading from psalms 124 verses 1 through 8 let us read together if the lord had not been on our side let israel say if the lord had not been on our side when people attack us they would have swallowed us alive when their anger flared against us the flood would have engulfed us the torrent would have swept over us. The raging waters would have swept us away. Praise be to the Lord, who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken, and we have escaped. A song of Acts of David. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Amen. May God add a blessing to the hearers and the doers of his holy word. Now it's the time where we all can come together to come to the altar. To Whether you're laying a burden down or praying for someone or standing in a gap, why don't you come right now? Come up to the front. Praise the Lord.
majesty. How I worship Let's do that one more time. the Lord on our side <laughs> where will we be <laughs> when the enemy tries to come at us and shift our focus if it had not been for the Lord on our side where will it be sometimes when you know I pray about the scripture <laughs> y'all may be reading into what I'm thinking about because yesterday I woke up with this feeling in my heart about something gonna go wrong. And I was actually thinking it was about my older son, and so I worried my husband. I said, oh, you gotta go with him because I don't want him to go to Chicago and play basketball because I just felt something wrong. So I was looking over here and I was praying, and it just so happened that I was celebrating with the McCloins yesterday, and Miles was texting me that he had rear-ended someone. And I was like, my heart dropped when I didn't see him in the room because he should be there. And I ran out and had my phone trying to get it together and he sent me his location and I scurried just around the corner and to know that God was on my side. Even though my focus was on something dark, when the enemy is trying to get at you, it said like a bird will be out of his grasp, flying away. So I'm so thankful that God is on my side. So I don't know what your journey, what the complication that the devil has put into your life, because he knows how to get to me with my family. He knows how to get to me when I'm working and my efforts are hard and things aren't making it towards my plan. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? Because even in those dark times, even those times that aren't meeting Deanna's expectations, I'm still on the side, right? Because it's not about my way. It's about his will for us and his will for me that it's going to make it all right. It's going to make it all right for you. So whatever your deliverance may be today, whatever that complication that you said, Lord, I can't do it another day. Because I've been dwelling with something for 10 years and I'm hoping that this, I'm close to telling you about something that God has for me because I know he's on my side. Because I've been faithful. And when you're faithful, he watches out for you. Walk in his will. Let him order your steps. So let's pray today. Lord, I'm thanking you. We're thanking you, Lord, and we're humbling ourselves in our hearts, Lord, being open and ready to receive, Lord. Lord, because we know this world will have us tell us that the dark and the wrong and that carjacking is for me and that hate is for me, Lord, but you said I'm on your side. Lord, so I'm thanking you right now, Lord, about all the power and all the glory you invested in us, Lord, to just bless your name continually, Lord, and praise your name, Lord, as we tarry, Lord, as we dwell, but not for long, Lord, because we'll go through those valleys, Lord, but we're going through with you. Lord, so we're asking and we're petitioning together, Lord, Lord, as we increase our faithfulness in you, Lord. Lord, we'll allow you to work in us, Lord, that we can be that vessel, Lord, for others to know that it's going to 
be all right, Lord. That is a higher power out there that is going to take care of us, Lord. Because we're focused, our focus is short-sighted, Lord. We should be looking to that everlasting, Lord. That forever and over in the glory land where we just gonna shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah. Lord, so we're thanking you right now, Lord. Bless those who are sick and shut in, Lord. Bless those who are afflicted, Lord. Bless those who don't know you, Lord. Let something about the way we walk and talk in our life shine, that they'll be so curious, that they'll want to say, how are you doing that? And we can open to Psalms 124 and say, here's the path they have for me, but he's on my side. He's on my side. and all the praise that's due to your name. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. of your praise this morning. In all things, give thanks. I always tell my family, never lose your praise. I don't care what is going on. You can praise your way to me. We're going to have a little talk with Jesus.
We can start making our way back to our seats for announcements. If we can transition back. Good morning, Trinity. God is good, and he is worthy. Aren't you glad? Amen, amen. I am happy to be back after being absent for a few weeks. Um, so I'm just happy to be back in, in my house. A few announcements today. Children's Church from ages 2 to 3 will be held today immediately following the choir selections if you have any questions or would like to assist please see Reverend Tim or Deborah McCoin um, there will be no young disciple class today I know they're upset but there will be uh, no men's fellowship next Saturday due to the July 4th holiday if you would like copies of the worship service after service today, wait about 10 minutes and please see the media team and they will be happy to get you one. Also, if you're interested in being on the media team, please see the media team and talk to them about it. Um, we have one, oh, the Compassion Center will be open after service today from one to two. 
We have um, a special announcement from Ms. Paula, if she would come up. Good morning, church family. Um, I'm here this morning on behalf of the Jamaica Medical Mission. We are nearing our first uh, medical mission to Negril, Jamaica. We are excited. God is good. He's blessing. Amen. Um, we are in short of some things, though, just a few things. You know, God has really blessed us, and he's just continued to bless us. And so the Singles Ministries has um, so graciously joined with the Jamaica Medical Mission to help them to acquire some supplies. So what we need now is just some some pharmaceutical supplies. Um, we are need, in need of multivitamins, Tylenol, leave or ibuprofen, aspirin, iron pills, antacid pills, B complex, triple antibiotic ointment, hydrocortisone, Zyrtex and Claritin, antifungal cream. Our biggest need, however, is for the fish oil. We need 30,000 capsules. Um, so if, if I'm asking, if you go into the store and you see some fish oil on sale, and sometimes you get buy one, get one free, uh, please buy them. Um, just know that they're going to a more than worthy cause. These things we buy every day, we just take it for granted. But here are people in need who are asking for something that we, they, they can't get. So I have placed the bin, my green and gray bin is back. <laughs> There's a bed outside in the North X, and there will be sheets on top of the bed listing everything I just said, and we ask that you buy these products, make sure they're unopened and not expired. And I promise you, they will be put to good use. And I thank you, the Singles Ministries thank you, the Medical Mission thank you, and God thanks you. Amen. I just have one correction to what uh, Reverend Paula said on the singles ministry. We are no longer called the single ministry. We have a new name. We are now known as the Ruth Ministry. And I will give you a little background. I promise you, Pastor, it will not take that long. I did have this up here. I wanted to tell you what exactly Ruth meant and why we picked that name. Oh, I had it up, I promise. Okay. Anyways, please see me after church. I, I told Pastor I was only going to keep this to a few seconds, um, being the new timeline. So we are known as, as the Ruth Ministry. We do have um, a biblically-based reason behind it, and we are more than happy to share that with you later on. Just see us, and we'll, we'll share it with you. As a reminder, uh, tune in to WYLL 1160 AM every Sunday evening for Life Lessons with Pastor Love. At this time, we would like to welcome our returning guest and first-time visitors. If you would please stand. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Our ushers will be over to give you a visitor's card. If you will please fill that out and drop it in the offertory when it comes by. Once again, we know you have a host of churches to choose from on a Sunday morning, and we're glad you're worshiping here with us and hope to see you again. Reminder, Stacy Hatchett will be doing announcements next week, so if you have anything, please get announcements into her uh, by Saturday noon at the website, or if you have her number, text her, or see anybody on the announcement team, and we can get it to her. My thought of the week, I'm just happy to be home. I am happy to be well and happy to be home, and I hope you all are feeling the same way. And with that said, we are happy to be in the Lord's house here at Trinity Baptist Community Church. Our pastor is Bishop Dr. Michael J. Love. Trinity is a teaching ministry of God's holy word. We touch, share, love, and care, and thank God for this opportunity to praise and worship him. If you are looking for a church home when Bishop Love opens the doors, feel free to give your hearts to Christ and your hands in fellowship to Trinity. Have a blessed day. Amen.
Let me add my voice to the welcome on this Sunday morning. It's so good to be in the Lord's house on this beautiful day. Amen? Amen. He has blessed us tremendously. Uh, let, me, let me say a couple of thank yous, and then I'll, I'll get off quickly here. But I wanted to uh, just get a couple of thank yous for the last couple of Sundays. We had a tremendous XL1 service, as we, rec as we recognized and congratulated our high school, college, and, uh, and graduate school graduates uh, for the year. Thank you all for putting that together, Deanna and the team, on the second Sunday of June. We just had a fabulous day. And on last Sunday, uh, we, when we had the chance to celebrate not only Father's Day, but Men's Appreciation, it, it was just a great gathering, and, uh, and the meal was beautifully done outside. We had a great fellowship on the Narthex, and so I just want to say thank you to those teams that put that all together. It was, uh, it was a very special time. We are looking forward into the month of July. We've got some things on the calendar that are exciting. We know we've got the XL2 as we celebrate the graduation of our, of our lower level. Let's say what we got, the elementary, going into first grade, going into junior high. I'm going to miss that stuff. <laughs> going into high school, as we, as we celebrate those that are, that are moving up the levels there, we want to make sure that you get your information in to Deb and Tim. Yep. Uh, Reverend Tim and Deb, uh, so that we can uh, recognize you on second Sunday in July. And we're moving our picnic, our annual picnic, to the, f to the last Sunday, the fifth Sunday this year in July, uh, so that we can make sure we can include uh, any of our college students that are still with us during the summer times and just have that full celebration. So we'll, if you know how the picnics go, we have a fantastic time on that casual day. So we'll be out, in the, we'll be out on, the, uh, on, the, on the East 40 over there. <laughs> Uh, in the in the field and just having a great day of fun and fellowship and food and and uh, it's time great time to invite some friends and family, you know summertime is always a big travel time but as I said last Sunday I want to I want to encourage and invite you and hopefully inspire you a little bit to reach out and invite friends and families and neighbors and loved ones uh, 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 to come and celebrate and come and share in the worship experience on Sunday as we pray for those who are traveling because everybody gets out their travel calendars when the weather gets warm. And so we want to be prayed up, and we want to be reaching out and inviting people to join us on service. Amen? amen. No, amen? amen. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> We're in the house together. We're in the house together. Has the Lord blessed anybody this week? Come on now. Yeah. Reverend Tim is heading this way. We're going to worship God with our giving and as our choir moves this way. And continue our celebration of praise on this beautiful Sunday morning. Let the church say amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward as we prepare. I just wanted to start off by um, thanking everyone who has uh, participated and in sewing into my baby's life. We uh, had her graduation party l last night or yesterday. And um, I just want to thank personally everyone for the gifts, even those who couldn't attend and those who did attend, and just for sewing it was just a blessing we had an open mic where people could uh, just share from them their hearts and uh, i said if you know she had a, a story from way back you could share how she impressed on your life and and what she meant to you that was just a blessing one thing that kind of blessed me is how many people uh considered leah their baby you know a lot of y'all was claiming my baby that she's my baby and um I, that, that just blessed my heart because in reality, I claim your baby. And uh, you all know, heard me many times get up here and use that frame, that phrase, our babies, and, and they are. They are the babies of this family, and uh, they are all of ours. God is loaning them to us for just a little while uh, while we are here, and it's just a blessing. So as we prepare our hearts, let's hear from the word of the Lord. <clears throat> But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. Let us bow our heads, humble our hearts. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to just give and to give back to you. We thank you for being a God who gives more than we could ever give, that, you, that we could never 
beat you in the giving business, Lord. And we just thank you that at this time we have an opportunity to recognize that with a little bit that which you've blessed us with. I thank you for giving us the power to have wealth and to work and to strength to earn. So, Lord, I just ask that this time we be guided by our hearts and by your spirit. We love you in Jesus' name. I mean, you guys are soldiers for the Lord. If you, everybody here should just pop right up. It should be like. All right, this is a nice upbeat song. So if you want to stand up and or step stuff your feet where you at, but stand up and give God some praise. Come on and give it with me. Amen. Yes, I am. Fighting for the Lord. On this Christian journey. 
beginning. To the swift and to the strong. But to the one that endure it. really on the battlefield, fighting for the Lord. Well, that, that kind of takes me right to the scripture that the Lord led me back to today, as it always tends to do. Turn with me once again to 1 Samuel, I, uh, this time chapter 24. I interrupted this, this uh, mini sermon series a few Sundays ago as we were taking lessons from the wilderness. I did the first couple and the Lord just wouldn't let me leave without at least finishing the trilogy. So uh, I found myself back on 1 Samuel chapter 24, focusing our attention this morning on verses, uh, I think I put up four through eight. 
we're going to put the King James translation up on the screen. Uh, I, I put as a key verse, uh, it's a verse number 12, I believe, for us, for our reading together, because it begins to capture the thought of what's happening during this whole chapter. So 1 Samuel 24, our key verse for reading will be verse number 12. And we have that on the screen. If you got, if you got this in your Bibles, would you say amen? Are we okay? If you don't mind standing with me, let's just read this one verse together uh, just to set the tone for our time together uh, of study and preparation. Verse 12 reads, May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. Well, that might be worth reading twice. Huh? Let's do that again. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you as you take your seats. Lessons in the wilderness of En Gedi. If you've been with us these several Sundays that we spent some time together in this particular study in the book, you'll know that we spent time with David as he's been in the wilderness of Ziph, and uh, uh, where the Ziphites basically gave him up, Saul is now, is now trailing him and, and attempting to destroy him. Uh, he's on the run, and King Saul is, is after him with all of his forces. And you begin to see just how God miraculously provides insight and wisdom and protection to his anointed uh, as he's indeed in the journey of trying to... Uh, trying to do what the Lord has called him to do while at the same time uh, run for his life. Uh, Saul has now chased him through the wilderness of Ziph. We've seen him escape miraculously to the wilderness of Maon. In Maon, uh, you begin to see how, uh, as, as they're journeying, last time we were together, as they're journeying on both sides of the, of the mountain, there, of the mountain the scriptures tell us there, Saul's army on one side, David's army on the other, how the Lord is keeping the protective barrier between the two of them. And just as, just as Saul is about to surround him with his army and basically destroy them, uh, the Philistines, he gets word that the Philistines have, have attacked back at the home front. It makes the question for you military-minded folk out there, what in the world is the king doing out there trying to kill off David anyway and leaving his, leaving his home unprotected to a degree? And so uh, Saul now, King Saul and his army now have to go back to protect the homeland. And miraculously, David is now allowed to escape and his army. And so while they're back there, the 24th chapter opens up by letting us know that when, 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 when Saul had finished the business that he had to do in protecting his homeland, uh, that he now turns, opening verse says, he now returns, after he returned from following the Philistines and driving them out, He's told that David is in the wilderness or the desert of En Gedi. En Gedi is somewhere near the Red Sea, the beautiful oasis. If you've ever traveled over in that part of the country, you know, you'll get a chance to, it's not an oasis today, but you'll get a chance to see just, uh, uh, just where it's located near the Dead Sea. It tells us that Saul has chosen 3,000 of his best men, uh, his chosen army out of Israel, and went to seek out David among the rocks and the wild goats. And, and he comes upon, in the verse 3 it says, he comes upon the sheepfolds on the way uh, where there was a cave. And it says, Saul went in to relieve himself. And now David and his men were sitting in the caves in the most part. They talk about these caves, just a little side note. They talk about these caves, the sheepfold in these caves up near the En Gedi. As if it's, uh, you know, for those of us who don't deal with sheep herding, particularly in those days, it's kind of hard to get a visual of what's taking place here. So if this is a kind of a fortification where they're protecting the sheep from, uh, from attack during the night and protecting them from those who might want to steal them uh, during the off hours, it's, it's, it's described as kind of a little barrier area there in which the sheep and the, and the shepherds can come along behind. Uh, and, and behind that there will be, since there are caves up in En Gedi, there will be deep caves. And in those caves it tells us that they, they tend to be so dark and moist that when you walk into the siding there that it completely, if you're coming out of a lighted area and you walk into one of those dark, deep caves, that 
it, it, it blinds you. Have, have you ever been in a situation where you walk from a, a bright lighted situation into a very dark situation? You just can't, your eyes just can't quite adjust to it. It's the sense of walking into this kind of a cave and you're, and you're somewhat blinded by walking into this dark crevice, if you will. Uh, so Saul now, King Saul has now walked into this cave to, to the text says, to relieve himself. And, and David and his men are in the cave. Inside the cave, the eyes have made the adjustment so that they now can recognize what's going on to the cave. Uh, the one moving from outside the cave into the cave uh, is somewhat blinded by the fact that you can only see just a little bit ahead of yourself because it's so dark inside the cave. I'm, I'm just trying to set the setting here so you can understand why this is taking place. So it seems to be taking place so easily. So I pick it up with verse number four, and I've only got two life lessons to share today. And I'm reading the Amplified Version. It says, David's men said unto him. Remember, Saul has gone into the cave to relieve himself. David and his men are sitting in the cave's innermost recesses. They're down in the deep part of the cave. Four says, David's men say to him, Behold the day of which the Lord said unto you, Lord, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, and you shall do with to him as seems good to you. I'm with the Amplified. It says, then David arose in the darkness and stealthily cut off the skirt, the skirt of uh, Saul's robe. Afterward, David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my master, the Lord's anointed, to put my hand out against him when he is the anointed of the Lord. Let, let, me, let me spend a little family time with you today, just on two lessons, if you don't mind. And the first life lesson I jotted down was simply this. Uh, is that print big enough for you? Not quite? When, when, let me read it to you. When revenge seems available. There you go. When revenge seems available. That was from my eyes. <laughs> they, they're helping the pastor out of here. <laughs> And your adversary seems vulnerable. Remember God's promises. Remember his preparation. Remember his protection on your life. And remember his purpose for your life. And be grace-filled today. Be grace-filled today. Uh, so now Saul is doing, has done and is doing everything he can do within his power and his might to track down, capture, and kill David. Because the spirit of the Lord has left him, and the jealousy, uh, the, the envy and jealousy has engulfed him, and he fears that David will, is threatening his throne. And even though David has a ragtag group, uh, of, I believe it says in one, one part of the chapter earlier, of about, about four to 600 men, 400 men, you know, the, uh, th those who are, you know, all the D guys, those who are in debt, <laughs> those, those who basically are discouraged, you know, basically the dregs of the, of the, but they've come to David in loyalty to him, and he's turned them into a fighting army. And, and now David has this, Saul is in the cave, and he's blinded somewhat by the darkness, relaxing, relieving, whatever he's doing in the cave. And David's men, I noticed this, because the lesson is taking place. David's men come to him and basically say, here's your opportunity for revenge. The Lord, and they, they, put a, they want to put a scripture on it. Have you ever been around folk who, <laughs> have you ever been around folk who, 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 who want to move you in a direction of, of taking, taking, taking it out on people who have done something wrong to you? Or have you ever felt inside that here's an opportunity, I know that person, these people have done me wrong, and, and, and you know, you probably said to yourself in one of your less spiritual moments, if I just ever get an opportunity, I'm trying to keep it real because, you know, all, all of us are super saints. So, you know. <laughs> if I, you know, all that wrong that they've done to me, if I just ever get an opportunity, don't, don't raise your hand, just kind of nod if you're in the same park room. I don't want the cameras panning anybody in here now just to get back a little bit of what they've done to me, 
than, than the Lord. I might not kill him, but I'm still going to hurt him. Well, then, if, if you've ever felt anything like that, then you have to begin, you begin to understand what the audience that David's dealing with. The men are basically saying to David, and, and they have the audacity to try to quote some scripture at him, to basically lay out some, thus saith the Lord to them. You know, here he is in the, the king has made the, the strategic mistake of stepping into a cave to relax, relieve, whatever he's, himself, and he seems to be doing this without the necessary escort. So now he's in the dark, and he can't see, but, the, but his so-called adversary can see him. And, and in the midst of that, he doesn't know what's down in the inner recesses of the cave while he's trying to relieve himself. And not recognizing the fact that he's vulnerable to whatever might be going on inside of the cave. He's just thinking, I've got the biggest force on the planet. Nobody's going to bother me. I can do what I need to do. I can go in here and relax and relieve myself. And how's David going? I'm chasing David. How's David going to bother me if he's anywhere around here? And in the midst of that, the boys in the background are saying, now here's your opportunity, and let me quote a verse to tell you that you're going to be righteous when you take his life. And David, to me, this David responds in an interesting way. Because to me, this feels like a test. This, this clearly feels like a, a test from the Lord. It's a, it's a test and it's a learning. I mean, it's a, and, and so all parties are in the process of this testing taking place here. When David stealthily, the text tells, David in the, in, the, in the resources of the darkness quietly cuts off a piece of his robe and then slips back into the darkness and comes back to the guys and says to them primarily, how, how is it that, how is it that I could possibly do this thing to my, to my master? One says to my father. He, he was David's father-in-law also. But more importantly, the Lord's anointed. The Lord had placed him in this position of authority. And he has been empowered for the season to be there. How can I possibly do this? What is he saying, church? My, my point here is that, number one, the testing and the message that David is now given, giving is pronounced not only God's preparation in his life, but to make it clear that God had not anointed him to be king and have it come into the process this way. Remember, David's been anointed a king. Uh, he's been selected out from the boys in the family, and you shall, you shall be the future king. And remember, David had the chance to sit and play the harp when Saul was being agitated when the spirit of the Lord had left him and he'd get angry and agitated and he called David in to play and calm him down with the harp. And you remember that when, when Goliath challenged them that it was David that rose up and said, now, now I'll go fight this uncircumcised uh, giant Philistine who has the audacity to threaten and, and, and belittle God's people. And you remember that it was David who came back to the chance and the cheers of the people Saul, you killed your thousands, but David has killed their tens of thousands. And so David had only done what God had given him the power and the preparation to do. But Saul, saw the, Saul did not see the goodness and the preparation that God was making in his life. He only saw an adversary. And so now he's, he's coming after David. So how do you get this kind of, how do you get this heart that now is bucking against the flesh, which I know has to be telling David his and, and the audience, you got all the boys in the background saying, David, you will be justified. You'll be righteous. The Lord, matter of fact, this is prophetic that the Lord has is, is put him in your hands and, and telling you you can do with him whatever you want to do. How does David resist the temptation to kill the king? There has to be something about the Lord working in and through believers. That uh, not only uh, opens up our heart to receive him in a very special way, enlarges our heart so that we can, we can acknowledge and feel his presence and power in our life, but also gives us a sense of uh, not just our wholeness, but a sense of how God has, this, has demonstrated his grace and his mercy toward us. You know, David, David could have been killed in a lot of different ways. Uh, he had seen the Lord protect him in the wilderness of Zip. He's seen the Lord protect him in the wilderness of Maon. 
He knew that if it were not for the Lord who was on his side, then, then, then he certainly wouldn't be standing here today. And, and so it wasn't, that because, it wasn't that because David had done everything right that God was so good to David. Because, you know, David, you know, you, you just track him on through the later years. You see David. He was, and yet God said, this is someone after my own heart. This is a man who, who, who has a heart for me. So I contend that it has to be God moving inside of the heart of the man. He's prepared him. He, he, he saw what the potential in David and knew that when the time of testing would come, he would empower and enlighten David so that he would make the right choice when the test came. And when the, choice, when the choice came, he would deliver a message and a model. And this is my moving forward, so I want to move too quickly towards my second point. But he would, he would begin to give that message out to those who were listening and watching. So the first encounter is, David, this is for you. And I know the guys are watching. And how are you going to act when now I deliver him up into your hand? How are you going to act, church family? You know, when that relative neighbor, co-worker, who's been talking about you like a dog. I'm going to put it in there. He hasn't even threatened your life. He just, you know, he just, he just wished he could kick you out of your job or kick you out of your house or, or cause all kind of havoc in your life. How, do you, how are you going to deal with that sort of a thing? There's something powerful about it being a new. Let me get to my New Testament side. There's something powerful about it being a new creature in Christ Jesus. There's something powerful about knowing uh, that Jesus gave his life on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins and mine. There's something powerful about knowing that the same God who delivered you and has forgiven you for all of your wrongdoing is the same God who can empower you to be able to express that forgiveness in the moment when you're tested toward the very ones who try to take the joy of your salvation from you. It was a David moment. It was a David moment in the cave. It was a David moment with his adversary standing right there in front of him. It was a David moment when he had an opportunity to take the very life of the man who's trying to take his life. Saul was coming at him with everything he had. Give me 3,000 of my best men, and I'm going out to 3,000. You need 3,000 of your best warriors to capture David and, and a ragtag of four to 600 men? You need to track him down. You, need, you, you, you just didn't give up on trying to hunt David down. You left, your, you left your homeland unprotected, Israel unprotected, so that you could snuff out this adversary. And yet God, and yet God didn't kill Saul. And the second thing I noticed was not only did he enlarge the heart of David, but he didn't, he didn't, he didn't kill Saul in the cave. I mean, the Lord could have dealt with Saul there. And yet he wanted, it appears to me, I may, be, I may be expanding the interpretation here, but it appears to me that he's given Saul an opportunity in this episode to hear the heart of God and to turn from his actions. It just feels like that to me. And so he says, listen to what David says. How can I do this thing to my master? How can, how, can I, how can I disrespect the man that God has in the role and responsibility? That's not a small statement. That's not small. But when the flesh is telling us we ought to be we ought to be doing everything to disrespect people in authority, he said. The New Testament writer would come back and say, you need, to give, you need to give honor and submission and respect to those who are in authority. And then he says, how can I do that to the Lord's anointed? The same God who has anointed me anointed him. And even though he's lost favor uh, with God, he's still in the position. And even though God has said that I will be in that position someday, he's not telling me to take this into my own hands and make that opportunity come, for, come forth. Basically, God is saying, you know, trust me. The, the, I'll handle this situation. I'm still in charge. And he still has a, has a role and responsibility fulfilled. So he's moving in David's heart, and he's... He's enlarging his vision and, and he's enlarging his passion. 
and he's checking him so that he does not step across the line. And David merely cuts off a piece of the skirt. And then, because it, it, it hurt his heart to even do that, he's now being groomed and developed to be a great king the heart of a king. Seven and eight say it this way. And so David checked his men, Amplified said. It's a strong term in the Hebrew. David checked his men with these words and did not let them, did not let them rise against Saul. But Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. David also rose afterward and went out of the cave and called after King Saul, saying, My lord the king, Amplified said. That's good. And when, they, when Saul looked, up, looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and did obeisance. Here's my last and second last life lesson from this little episode. When God inspires and empowers you to stand firm and to speak truth to the adversary, remember God will bless your message and your life model. Be obedient to that. God not only expanded the heart of David so that it gave him the compassion and the passion that was necessary so that he didn't take matters into his own hands, gave him the wisdom to understand that that's not how, that's not how he's, God is in the process of developing him to be the future king, to be a great leader of, his, of your people along, with, along and with being a great warrior. But he also was taking him through the testing process so that he would be a man of God, so that he knew to call on the Lord, to lean on the Lord. He's seen God do all these miraculous things. He's been delivered and protected by God. He's been forgiven and, and, and graced by God all the way through his journey. And yet he knows that he's only in the middle of his journey. He, he hasn't gotten to the point where he has received the fullness of the promise of God yet. And so his eyes need to be focused on where God has taken him. Who are you in Christ Jesus? Why does he have you here? What is the purpose he's laid out in front of you? And, and don't let the enemy distract you from what God has, has for you to do. And these types of things can get all in the way of God's calling and his joy on your life. And does anybody in the house know that when the, when the enemy tries to come in and steal your joy, the first thing he tries to do is distract you from the joy God has given you. Distract you from the purpose he's laid out in front of you. Doesn't he do that? He does not want you to keep your eyes on the prize God has given you. He wants you to be focused on the things that are going on around you. Be fearful of the things that could happen to you. Be worried about what the enemy might be plotting against you. Be wondering whether or not you've got enough strength to stand up against the things the enemy wants to throw at you. He wants you distracted by all of this peripheral stuff going on around you so that you lose sight of the fact that God has made a promise and he's faithful to his promise in your life. That, that's the enemy's games. And so David, my, my, my checkpoint here is that it appears to me that the Lord takes him through this test to, to, so that he can, he can explain and, 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 and proclaim to those all around him not only that God is in charge, but God is faithful to his promises. Watch what he does here. He, he calls, he says, number one, the, the scripture says in seven, Amplified says he checked his men. The Hebrew term is strong. That it basically gives a sense that he lays out in authoritative and unequivocal terms to his men that this is not happening under my watch. I'm expanding the Hebrew here. Help me out. He basically says to the boys, I hear you. Uh, you laid out your case, and you even tossed a little Bible on top of it. But let me tell you that you put the text, you took the text out of context, or you would understand the real reality of the promise God has made. God didn't say he was going to lay and put him in my hands so that I could destroy him. Then I would be a killer of a king. And then what would that do when I went back to become a king? That would position me to be killed by somebody else if I killed the king. There's some logic and some wisdom here going on. And that's not the heart of David. God has, God has developed the heart of this man. And he says, not only that, he says, I need you to understand that God has got this situation handled. The same God that kept us safe in the, in, the, in the wilderness of Ziph, kept us safe in the wilderness of Maon, miraculously caused Saul to go back to Israel to fight the battle against the Philistines when we could have been trapped and, and killed. 
is the same God who now moved us to Engedi. And now into Engedi, while we're relaxing and keeping ourselves, push, push Saul into our hands, not so that I can kill him, but so that I can instruct him on how good God is. And so David begins to lay out, when he sees Saul, he does something powerful. It says in the text here that he sees Saul and he tells him, he calls him my Lord and my King. He expresses his loyalty to the man God has placed in the position. All the while knowing that he's the future king in process. And he gives, and when, when Saul turns to him, the text says, he bows down to him. And the rest of the story, if, as you read that chapter, is he begins to lay out his case to King Saul. And the pastor's paraphrase says, King, you're listening to all the wrong folk. He says, you're listening to folk who are telling you that I'm out here trying to steal your throne and take everything that you have. He said, that's not me. That's not what this is about. He says, and, 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 and you need to be consulting God to get the wisdom that you need on this thing. You don't need to be listening. <laughs> this, is, this is wisdom for the ages. You don't need to be listening to the crowd. I'm going to help somebody other than the TV camera. When your heart is breaking and your heart is aching and you're wondering how am I going to make it through, you're wondering why the forces of the world and everything seem to be coming down on me and coming up against me, you're wondering how am I going to be able to stand in the midst of this thing when everything seems to be crushing down on me and your fears are welling up inside of you and you're wondering how am I able to do what I need to do, yet God has said that I'm this individual, but yet the world is telling me that I'm somebody else and they're willing to take everything that I have from me. How do I find the strength to stand firm in the midst of an avalanche of fear and an avalanche of army in front of me. How can I do that in the name of Jesus? The text, the text tells me that as he gave him obedience, as he showed his loyalty, he laid out his case. And he said, the Lord knows my heart. The Lord knows who I am. The Lord knows I, I could have, he holds up the cloth. And he says, Saul, if this was about killing you, then I was right next to you. I could have taken your life at any moment. Oh, and I had all the boys in the background cheering me on. He said, but I stand in loyalty to you. He said, let the Lord decide between you and me. <laughs> he said, let, let the Lord, the Lord knows our hearts. And in our key verse, he says, the Lord will handle this situation. He will handle what's going on with you between you and him. He will handle what's going on between me and you. He said, but I'm not going to be the one who lifts my hand to destroy you. And as you read down there, it tells you that Saul began to, you know, as, as he, it, it's almost like David has is, David is, is laid out this, uh, this, this, this message powerfully, passionately. It tells us that Saul, Saul heart, Saul's heart had a temporary change. And he says, you're a righteous man, David. Pastor paraphrase, you're, you're a better man than I am. Because King Saul knows that he would have taken his life if he had caught him in that same situation. <laughs> He'd have been a dead brother right there. He says, you're righteous. Surely the Lord has his hand on you. He's like he's saying all the right things. Surely the Lord has his hand on you. Surely you're going to be a future king. Surely you're a righteous man. And he says to David, well, don't. When you, get to, when you get to your kingdom, will you make sure that you don't kill off my, you know, my, my, my family members? And David again shows his heart. He says they will be protected with me. So I, I, I see how God has taken... David and Saul and, the, and his, David's men and whoever the other audience might be through this test of faith, this test of do I seek revenge or do I provide forgiveness? If the Lord has forgiven me, can I, can, is it possible for that, that kind of forgiveness to flow out in and through me and out of me and toward those who want to 
who want to do me harm. It, can I, I know I can't do this in my own strength, but Lord, can you provide the strength that's needed to be able to do this because my flesh is telling me something totally different over here. But the spirit inside of me is telling me the, the right thing to do. And Lord, how do I stay obedient to your call and to your word in my life? You know, if I'm not following, if I'm not in that word, you know, meditating on it day in and day out so that I can be like a tree planted by water, you know, so that my leaf can flourish even in the midst of a drought type of a season. Don't, don't, don't we want that, Lord? If, if, we can, if we can get to where we can just trust in the Lord enough in those moments of testing, in those moments of anxiety, in those moments of fear to where we can remove, uh, 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 what is forgiven? Remove, remove my my sense of uh, ownership of, of vengeance or, or, what's my term, of judgment maybe is my term. Take it off of my plate and put it back where it belongs on the Lord's plate. Lord, you judge between me and, my, and this adversary here. You, you, you know what's going on in my heart and his or her heart now. And Lord, you make it all work out because I'm not looking for the battle. I'm looking for a sense of family, some reconciliation. Lord, make it right, if you will. And if making it right means that we need some separation between us, then, Lord, you take care of that, too. I mean, you know, you're the all-knowing God. Because along with forgiveness comes a little bit of wisdom, I do believe. You know? Because this Saul didn't quite give up the fight. But David did continue on his journey. So I, 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 I grabbed some, some powerful things about Enlarging God, enlarging our hearts, and God giving us a heart of forgiveness, and God giving us the strength to be able to, to, uh, to walk in, in, in his right way uh, with his empowerment. And I, and I took something else away about how God can make us stand firm in the midst of this and speak truth, speak truth to whatever the power or the adversary might be, knowing that it is God who blesses it. It's not the power of my words that's going to make this thing come right. I mean, David could have said all the smooth things. He could have wrote those psalms and made them sound pretty and rolled them out and played. He could have broke out his harp and started playing in front of Saul like in the days of old. But if the spirit of the Lord were not in that thing, all that would have been was pretty words and beautiful music. Saul just would have whipped out his sword, sword and probably cut his head off and been done with it. But it was the protection of God. It was God's preparation. It was knowing that God did not bring him to this moment in time to leave him here. This was a part of how do you grow in the process and to prepare to become who God has called you to be. That's what I came by to share with you just for a moment here. When you go through those difficult moments, church, and I'm about to close up the book. When you go through those difficult moments and it feels like the enemy has a stranglehold on you and, it, and he's trying to tap in and take your joy, and, and then the Holy Spirit comes and wells up inside of you and gives you a sense that indeed you are the child of the king, and that he has a plan and purpose for your life, and that you need not worry about what's going on on the outside. Just trust in the God who has you covered on the inside and outside. Then when you know that and you can walk in that, then you can look at your adversary with a different set of eyes, with an enlarged heart. You know that there's only so much that that person can do in your life journey. And you can stand tall and proclaim the truth in Christ Jesus. That's what I came by to tell you this morning. That's really it. It was a two-minute sermon that I expanded out. Let me pray for you, and we're going to head on out here today. Father God, I just want to thank you for this moment and for this opportunity you blessed us with. Thank you for giving us the grace and the mercy, the joy and the blessing to be able to stand tall, stand firm in your word and in you, Lord, in Christ, and be able to face those who call themselves our adversaries with a new sense of assurance and hope and to know, Lord, that you've got this all covered some kind of way in your wisdom and your might, your love, your grace, and your mercy. And because you've shown us such grace and mercy, not only for salvation but for every component of our life journey, you pour into us and out through us your grace so that as we demonstrate the impact on our lives and proclaim it to those whom we come in contact with, they will see, uh, they will see the impact of you in and on us and want to know who this Jesus is that we love and serve. And with that opportunity, give us boldness to be able to proclaim 
the good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And then, Lord, we know that we're only seed planted. And so as we, as we just spread the seed out, Lord, we're praying that, that the ground will be prepared and will be receptive to your word. Some heart will be changed and come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. In his precious name we pray. And we give you thanks, Lord. Amen. And amen. As the musicians come, we're going to open up the doors of the church and extend an invitation if you're here to come and become a part of the Trinity family. If you're seeking a church home or your Christian experience, we invite you to come down front and let us introduce you. Or as a candidate for baptism, if you have accepted him today. As our new members, directors come down front. Let us stand together. The doors of the church are open. The invitation to membership is extended to you if you're here. And we'd love to invite, we'd love to welcome you home if the Lord is calling you in this direction today. Won't you take that step of faith? The doors are open. All the way. Lord, a hand clap of praise. Oh, yeah. Thank you, ladies. Take your neighbor by the hand as we prepare to close with our benediction. Thanking God for this beautiful day. My, my. With our heads bowed, with our eyes closed, and with our hearts humble before the living God. Assuming an attitude of prayer, lifting our hands to him in praise. Now unto him who is able to keep you and me from falling. And present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, power now henceforth and forevermore, that all God's people say, Amen, holy. God keep you. Give somebody a hug before you leave today. Invite somebody to the church next Sunday morning. Have a good
great day in the Lord.